past class we discussed the different committees which were set up by the government and the industry bodies to look at this uh, look at corporate governance in the country. Specifically, we looked at the reports of four committees. One is the Cadbury committee report, second is the CI committee report, third is the Kumar Mangalam Birla committee report, then the fourth one Narayan Murthy committee report. All of them have made important recommendations on different aspects of corporate governance. Now, before we uh, close this uh, corporate governance, I want to draw your attention to the book which I have written on strategic management. Go to chapter number 4 and section 4.2. If you go to section 4.2, you have as you have a definition for uh, you have a section devoted to for social audit you have a section devoted to responsibilities of csr organizations i will just read from the book these particular sections a few points which may be of interest to you. 1. Corporate social responsibility that is CSR is concerned with the ways in which an organization exceeds the minimum obligations to stakeholders specified through regulations and corporate governance. This includes such aspects as to how the conflicting demands of different stakeholders can be reconciled. A company's stakeholders are all, are all those who are influenced by or can influence a company's decisions and actions. These can include but are not limited to employees, customers, suppliers, community organizations, subsidiaries and affiliates, joint venture partners, local neighborhoods, investors and shareholders or a sole owner. Since the legal and regulatory framework pay uneven attention to the rights of different stakeholders, it is useful to distinguish between different stakeholders who may consist of contractual stakeholders that is customers, suppliers and employees who have a legal relationship with the organization and community stakeholders that is local communities, consumers in general and pressure groups who do not have the protection of the law to the same extent as the first group. Kindly note this sentence, CSR is particularly important to community stakeholders. CSR is particularly important to community stakeholders. Then section 4.3 deals with responsibilities of CSR organizations. I just quote from the book only, CSR organizations are responsible for internal and external aspects concerning the organization. What are the internal aspects? One is employee welfare, can be medical or assistance for defendants working conditions can be social and sporting clubs, safety standards, etc. Job design, meaning designing of jobs for the satisfaction of workers. Intellectual property, meaning respecting and not claiming corporate ownership 
of the private knowledge of individuals. What do you mean by that? Some, uh, somebody has done something, the credit should go to the person concerned. And what are the external aspects? Green issues, this is something which is very current now that is reducing pollution and conservation of energy, products danger arising from the careless use of products by consumers, then markets and marketing issues related to advertising standards, withholding of information etcetera. Then suppliers issues related to fair terms of trade and blacklisting. Employment issues related to positive discrimination in favor of minorities and discrimination in jobs and maintaining jobs. Then community activities such as sponsoring of events and supporting good work. Why do we have social auditing? Because most of the companies lay down guidelines on some or other issues, but some have no programs at all. So, how does social auditing help? Social auditing is a way of ensuring that these issues of corporate social responsibility get systematically reviewed. So, the next para tells you organizations own land, consume water, air and take the services of other utilities. Thus, they affect communities in various ways. Social auditing is carried out to study the level the company's effect on the stability of local employment levels, local taxes paid by it, contribution to local charities, labor relations, hiring, promotion and free practices water, air and noise pollution, power and water conservation, plant appearance, traffic flow, impact on local politics, contribution to research and import substitution, support to local industries. In other words, a social auditor has to look at the positive social changes brought about by the company. So, he also has to scrutinize the shortfalls and the non-achievements. So, when he does that, he has to take into account the effects, effects of events beyond the boundary of the program, all of which the designers of the program may not have been in a position to envisage and allow for implementers to deal with. Some of the serious problems which uh, social auditors face or difficulties which they face is the absence of a well conceived information system as part and parcel of a social welfare program. So, these are some of the things which one, which one has to take into account when you are looking at CSR. So, CSR is also linked very closely to principles of sustainable development in proposing that enterprises should be obliged to make decisions based not only on the financial stroke economic factors, but also on the social and environmental consequences of their activities. So, if you just look at table 4.1 on page 56, it gives you under four headings the sub factors of the different groups with reference to employees, customers, government and society. This is what we discussed in a different way with respect to the IPCL company okay. and uh, the that was one of the exercises which was done in the Indian context. So, there are some other methods of social auditing also which interested students may like to refer. One is what is called the Linus model of social audit, second is the social process or program management audit 
and the third is the macro micro social indicator audit. The fourth is the comprehensive audit covering various aspects such as energy, environment and human resources. The fifth one is the ABC approach to social audit. Of course, we have discussed one method which was done in the Indian context that is the IPC, IPCL social audit checklist. Okay. So, this is what uh, we are looking at. If you, these are the reports which we looked at. Then when we, when we went further, we looked at the recommendations made by each of these committees that is the Cadbury committee, the CII committee, then the Kumar Mangalam Birla report, then the Narayan Murthy committee report. This is uh, Narayan Murthy committee report is one of the latest reports in uh, 2003. So, where we just then we came out with the global issues for the 21st century, where we said as firms become increasingly global, BODs may need to become more international. BODs may have to consider the interests of all key stakeholders and not just who own stock while taking strategic decisions. This is what uh, we discussed now also so many stakeholders can be community all those types of things. Then ability to articulate a strategic vision and to motivate people to achieve it may become the most important characteristics, one of the most important characteristics required of a CEO. So, this is uh, where we, what we discussed. Now, with uh, with the background of all this information with respect to the, social, the CSR, the social audit, the 7S matrix, all that. Let us look at a few uh, assignment questions which you can perhaps take up. So, one of the, the next assignment question which you can perhaps handle is what I am going to give you now. These are the questions on the 7S framework. The first question is what are the components of the 7S framework? So, what am I asking you here? I am asking you here to write down all the 7S's. Give me all the 7S's starting from structure, strategy, all the 7S's. Give me the 7S's. The second one is, I am asking you a question, why is there a growing interest? Why is there a growing interest to study culture in an organization? Examine this in the light of the 7S framework. This is what we discussed in great detail when we were looking at the 7S framework. the impact of culture. If you really look at this, you can also bring to bear some of the points that have happened after the LPG in the country. This LPG referred to as liberalization, privatization and globalization. What has happened? There is a very strong feeling that in the last 10 years particularly, our value systems that is the Indian culture and the Indian values have suffered a great knock at the hands of this LPG in the sense that uh, there is a feeling among parents that children are not listening to them. And there is a feeling that children are going astray by what the media transmits, all those types of things. So, this is uh, 
and there is also a feeling among the parents that as soon as the children get to work, their work culture and the culture in the family, there is a lot of gap and there is a very strong feeling that the children are trying to go away from the established norms. All these things which you can bring out, what is this, uh, what is happening to culture in the light of this LPG era. Now, try to look at it from the 7S framework, one of the very important yeses in that which we discussed. Then the third question which I want you to answer is examine critically how far the 7S framework is helpful for organizations operating in the liberalized Indian context. So, I have tried to provide answers in my own way when you if you listen to all the lectures. So, one of the important things that we have seen is that while liberalization on the one hand has brought about opportunities, on the other hand it has also sounded the death knell for companies which are not able to adapt. In this uh, category, there are both private sector and public sector organizations, both of them have suffered and many small scale industries and also medium scale industries they have really borne the brunt of this LPG attack in the sense that if you really see some of the small scale industry sheds, they are more or less empty. You can take the example of Bangalore only and you find that most of them are out of business. So, normally the small scale industries have their own working capital problems. So, here is a new environment which has got created where the technology changes that are taking place are very rapid and the Indian small scale industry has got its own limitations to adjust to this and they found that uh, this adjustment was a real problem. So, all these aspects you can bring about while answering the questions. Uh, the question, the other aspect that you can possibly say is okay, th these things have happened, but how can you possibly, what is the type of uh, suggestion which you can give to organizations which are operating in the present uh, liberalized environment. So, how should they really cope with this? So, you can go to the different modes of decision making, try to see which one can be best and try to bring out those salient points. The other question which I wanted to ask, which I want you to ask, uh, which I want you to answer is discuss the key provisions of the this uh, Indian Companies Act which aim to regulate the functioning of the BOD that is the board of directors. What are the drawbacks of the prevailing board functioning in India? So, I just uh, I have tried to answer this question while I was discussing this topic. So, what is really happening? So, sections 291 to 293 of the Indian Companies Act very important while um, discussing the BOD, one gives the power, the other gives the restrictions which are placed on the BOD, then you get into when you are able to list these two sections that is the 291 and 293 comprehensively, you are able to give the powers and the restrictions of the BOD. And you can uh, supplement it with section 292, where other key provisions are also mentioned. 
I have also brought out what are the types of drawbacks of the prevailing bolt functioning. So, one of the drawbacks, some of these drawbacks, how it can be obviated, you can discuss that also whether uh, it would be better to have a board, a director from within or from or have an expertise from outside who can be viewing the company more objectively compared to an insider all those types of things and what is the type of remuneration this uh, B, the director on the BOD should be getting and what is really happening in the Indian context are they getting that type of remuneration if they are not getting that make recommendations or suggestions to for them to get this type of uh, uh, remuneration as well. Then the next question which I want you to answer is compare completely outsider, wholly insider and mixed type of BOD. That is uh, suppose it is a completely outsider BOD. So, you have a totally objective view. But you may also have a problem that some of the what do you call factual problems or factual situations that are prevalent on the ground that is in the company may tend to get glassed over because the person who is controlling is a completely outsider not fully aware of the gross realities. Then the wholly insider board, what is the type of problems that you may have? They have all been within, they have all groomed up in the company, within the company for a long, uh, for a long time. The result is they may not take a very objective view of the competitive environment. This is one of the question marks may not always happen, but now what do you want, what does a company really want? It wants the inside experience, it also wants the objective use, both of them to help the company in coming forward or in going forward. So, that is uh, the one which is the mixed type of BOD. Then the last question which I want you to answer is what is the role of the BOD in relation to strategic management? So, I have tried to answer this question also when we discussed the role of the BOD. They said, okay, suppose it is a very passive BOD, then what is going to happen? You find that the CEO really exercises the maximum power, he can bulldoze the BOD and take own strategic decisions and the board just acts as an approval or gives its stamp of approval for the decisions by the taken by the CEO. So, the best method of board functioning or the best relationship between the directors and the top management could be the participative style where both of them participate to bring about the desired changes in the organizations. This is the, sec the second assignment which I want you to attempt. Now, I also want you to attempt one more assignment, the, that is the third assignment which I, which you can just uh, look at this assignment questions also. The, these questions are with respect to the CSR which we have discussed. What are the types of questions which I have, which I am asking you? I am asking you the following questions. One is what is the relationship between corporate governance and social responsibility? We have discussed this in great detail. Then draw, a, does a company have to act selflessly to be considered socially responsible? So, how do you answer these questions? Discuss the four uh, 
roles or the four aspects of business which I have listed for you. When you discuss the uh, four aspects of business that is the ethical or the responsibilities of business, one is the ethical, the second is the legal, the third is the uh, one is the first is the economic where one must do, then legal have to do, ethical should do and the fourth one is discretionary might do. So, discuss these four responsibilities of business you will get an answer to this question. Then the third question which I want you to answer is uh, what characteristics of behavior of organizational management are considered ethical? I have given you what is this ethical behavior? I have brought out for you this um, utility approach, then the individual rights approach then the justice approach. So, you can look at that and answer this question. Then the fourth question which I want you to answer is sketch the internal and the external aspects of social responsibility of an organization of your choice. So, what I want you to do is take any organization which you know of or about which you have got information. So, look at uh, the internal and external aspects of social responsibility. So, you can take pick up Infosys itself, what is the roles with respect to social responsibility, it is doing all those types of things whether it is provision of toilets or maintenance of roads or assistance to hospitals all the things or provision of what do you call directions for traffic in big cities all these types of things. Then analyze the performance of this organization in meeting these aspects. So, you can really look at the way the organizations the organization has discharged this responsibility or discharged this role. Then I want you to look at the IPCL study that is the factors and sub factors considered for determining social responsibility in the IPCL study. So, you can also look at the different committees which I listed for you that is the four committees and uh, highlight the important salient recommendations also. So, with uh, this we come to the end of a uh, one important aspect of um, this strategic management course. We will now take up another important aspect of the strategic this course that is how to go about an external environment analysis. So, this external environment analysis or the external landscape analysis. So, how do we the environmental landscape analysis, how do we go about this environmental landscape analysis? So, let me just take you down to this landscape analysis. This can just bringing to you the important aspects of this. So, just uh, what is environmental analysis? So, the environmental analysis as I mentioned to you in passing when we were discussing, we are looking at the opportunities and threats the external environment holds for an organization. What are the types of opportunities and what are the types of threats? Then how do you define this environmental threat? Normally, you look at threat as a challenge that is it is a challenge posed by an unfavorable trend something unfavorable has happened and what is the challenge that it has brought about for the organization. So, if you look at uh, liberalization that was a challenge for the Indian industries especially the public sector. So, they were forced to really look at 
competition and they were forced to look take competition head on one second thing which happened this competition was not restricted only to Indian companies in came the foreign companies the multinational companies. So, the Indian companies not only had to face competition from within, but also from global companies. So, this is uh, one of the greatest challenges that came in. So, if you really see the types of competition which you are seeing in consumer industry is something unimaginable, even a detergent industry. So, you have an established player like Hindustan Lever, you have other multinational companies coming out with their own products and even though being an established player, a company like Hindustan Lever finds the going very tough and finds the going very tough in order to hold on to the market share which it has already acquired and which uh, the company has acquired putting in lot of efforts. It is considered uh, one of the best marketing companies in India. So, this is where this is the type of challenge even a company like Hindustan Lever is facing. Then what is this environmental opportunity? So, on the one hand you have this, the other hand on the other hand you also have opportunities for companies to expand their horizon of business. That is you can look at environmental opportunity as an attractive arena for companies action where it would enjoy a competitive advantage. Suppose you are able to you have the core competence that is the company has the core competence then why should it not end cash on the core competence? Why should it just look at the core competence only in the domestic market? Is it possible to expand the horizons? So, this is what uh, most of these uh, IT companies who are operating in India or who started their operations from India have capitalized on. So, they said here is uh, some educated manpower available to execute the jobs and execute the jobs in a cost effective manner. So, many of these uh, IT companies have become global players. So, you have on you have the threat you have the opportunity. So, these two aspects that is the threat and the opportunities are the ones which are looked with respect to the external environment. Now, when you are drawing a taxonomy of the environment for a firm, let us say you want to draw the taxonomy of the environment for a firm, you look at the mega environment, you look at the micro environment and you also look at the relevant environment. What can be the mega environment? The mega environment is something more global, the micro environment is something which is more of relevance to the organization that is more local where the organization is uh, housed or is headquartered. Then what is the relevant environment between this mega and the micro the organization picks up those aspects where it would like to operate. So, these are the relevant environments. I will explain this to you as we go along by a diagram. Now, I bring a few aspects of mega environment to your consideration. One could be the technological advances. Let us say there is Suppose, the transportation capability of the country is has shown tremendous improvement, then what does it mean? The mega environment is such that you can reach between different places very fast. This is what you are seeing in different countries of the world when you have very fast trains super fast trains. 
So, you have this TGVs in Europe where you can cover some 300 kilometers in about an hour or hour and a half time. So, these are all things which are which is giving the country an increased transportation capability. So, what is going to happen? Your, you, your logistics capability that is the ability to make your products accessible and the ability to have your manpower moved from your headquarters to different places all these things get a tremendous boost. When they get a tremendous boost automatically this contributes to the setting up of the our industry in that particular place or the particular country all these things. Similarly, increased mastery over energy. So, we are every day facing problems in our country with respect to energy, some parts of the country not having uh, the power all the 24 hours when they have the power, they do not have the requisite what do you call the voltage is sometimes low, sometimes the voltage is high, you have this varied frequencies coming in all this is likely to affect industrial production, all this likely to affect the organizational environment. Suppose an organization is uh, suppose you as a country we are able to have a mastery over energy. So, no none of these types of problems which I just mentioned it can be a tremendous boost, it can be a tremendous technological advance. Similarly, increased ability to extend and control life and serviceability. So, these are some of the new things which R and D is coming out with. So, all your advances with respect to many of these uh, nanomaterials, then uh, your genes, all these things are the types of research that is going on to increase the what do you call the serviceability of uh, human lives itself not to speak of the products all these things are uh, really contributing to the particular country getting lot of attention. Similarly, the increased ability to alter characteristic of materials. So, you have um, the superconductivity materials. So, all these types of materials which can give what do you call the types of trains which are uh, which are operating in Japan nearly a supersonic type of train. Then all these are due to the terrific advancements that have taken place. Then the extension of man's sensory capability. So, all these visual medias which you are seeing how it is happening. Similarly, the growing mechanization of physical abilities. So, physical activities. So, you are seeing so many things where you had to exert yourself. So, starting from your consumer durable products like the washing machine or the oven all these types of things contributing to this. Then the growing mechanization of intellectual processes. So, this is what the IT revolution in the country has brought about in our own country. So, many of the jobs on which you had to really exert yourself very heavily taken over by the IT and you are able to really come out with come out with the answers to the systems quite fast. So, this is what uh, this uh, mega environment what are the indicators of this mega environment really mean. So, I just bring to you some aspects of this. If you look at this figure 6, uh, this first figure here, it gives you the mega environment that is the outermost circle. The, the next inner circle gives you the micro environment, then 
the innermost circle gives the internal environment that is the environment within the form. Then there is a hashed portion which is shown here, this hashed portion which is uh, shown here gives you the what do you call this hashed portion tells you the ruler gives you the relevant environment. If you look at this relevant environment, it can it encompasses some aspects of the micro as well as the mega environment and of course, it encompasses the internal environment of the organization. So, when you are looking at the taxonomy of the firm's environment, you have the internal environment, then you have the micro environment, you have the mega environment, then there is this hatchet portion which gives the relevant environment. So, the relevant environment comprises of some aspects of the micro and some aspects of the mega and of course, it builds on the internal environment in the organization. Now, what are these constituents of the mega environment is listed to you in the second figure. The mega environment consists of the economic factors, then the technological factors, the political factors then the social factors, then the regulatory factors. All these five put together forming what we call the mega environment and I gave you some examples of this mega environment just now. What could be the indicators of this mega environment like this increased mastery over energy increase in transportation capability all those types of things. Then what is this micro environment? When we are looking at micro environment, we are going a little further down. So, what is it that we are looking at? We are looking at suppliers, we are looking at marketing intermediaries, we are looking at market types we are looking at market demand, we are looking at competition. So, if you really see the top ones that is the suppliers, the marketing intermediaries, the market types, the market demand and competition all this having an interface with the market. Then now, come to the bottom ones that is the financial institutions, the regulatory provisions, the industrial clim relations climate, then the availability of skilled manpower, the availability of skilled manpower. All these are, what are these? If you really see, what is a financial institution? The financial institution is an institution which the company may be banking upon to draw some financial resources. It might have helped the company to come into being and it might be continuing to come help the company in its working. The regulatory provisions something connected with the legal framework within which the company has to operate. So, you have to really conform to this. The industrial relations climate, then what, what do you mean by this? How, how difficult it is or how easy it is to operate your company? In order to do this, you should be having, suppose your company is an IT company 
the place from where you are operating you must be able to have a skilled manpower. So, almost all these ITES companies if you really see they are housed in places where the availability of technical manpower is very high. So, a place like Bangalore if you really look at it you have large IT companies because the manpower that you are able to get and not only from within perhaps draw from other parts of the country into a city like Bangalore can be huge which has fostered the growth of these types of companies. So, these are the when you look at this you can more or less say these are the different actors in the different environments that is with respect to mega environment you have the actors regulatory, political, economic, technological and social with respect to the micro environment you have the market actors like suppliers, you have marketing intermediaries, you have market types, you have market demand and then you have competition. Then you also have some of the institutions with which the company might be dealing, it can be financial institution or it can be institution where you are looking at uh, the, the institution dealing with the regulatory provisions or it can be one where you look at the industrial relations climate and then the fourth aspect which I just mentioned is the availability of skilled manpower. So, these are the different actors which you might be looking at with respect to the different environments. Then we have this relevant environment which is a which can have some aspects of micro and some aspects of mega built into it. And of course, you are building this on this relevant environment on the internal environment that is existing in the organization. So, you are looking at the taxonomy of the firm's environment from this from the internal environments angle look at the, the micro, the mega and the relevant environment. Then I have given you what are the constituents of the mega environment. Then I have also given you what are the constituents of the micro environment. I have also given you some examples of this indicators of this mega environment. We will stop here, we will continue further on more all these indicators in the next session. Thank you.